thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to speak. Uh, I spoke at this meeting uh, way back in 2018, uh, and that was a great time. Um, so I'm very happy to be back. Uh, although I would like to be in Vienna in person, of course, that's um, not possible right now. So this is based on uh, joint work with Nikos Athanasiou, who's at Imperial now. This was done when uh, he was still at Oxford and, and I was too. Um, and we'll be talking about some some work, which is um, which is a paper on the on the archive, which you can find. So I'm not going to bore you with the most uh, kind of uh, elementary slide. I'm sure you're all very familiar with this. Um, of course, I won't be dealing with uh, any ma any matter here. So. The strain equations will just be the ones in um, vacuum where T is zero and we're in N equals three. So space time dimension N equals uh, four. So these are my equations and we'll be talking about bl black hole formation. Now, what do we actually know about black hole formation? Well, in spherical symmetry, uh, there are, of course, the 1939 Oppenheimer-Schneider spherically symmetric. We have the dust models. And in the context of a scalar field, we have the uh, work of Christodoulou, which spans the 1990s, where we have a, a, a pretty good understanding of what happens in that context. And that's both with respect to um, black hole formation to some extent, uh, weak cosmic censorship um, and so on. But of course, more generally, you know, we wanna know how do black holes form dynamically uh, without these uh, assumptions of spherical symmetry. We'd like to know that when they form, do they actually asymptote to model solutions uh, in the context of vacuum? Of course, that's important for astrophysics. You know, in astrophysics, most of the time people superimpose things like the angular momentum or the mass or the radius on the observations. And that's only valid if the uh, real, uh, you know, astrophysical system um, is a good uh, approximator or approximates these model solutions. Uh, and then of course, this question of black hole interiors is, is much more like Schwarzschild. Uh, well, are the interiors more like Schwarzschild or Kerr? Namely, what's the nature of the, of the singularity inside or is there a Cauchy horizon, et cetera? Um, that's strong cosmic censorship. So we won't be talking about that, but that's another question you could ask about black holes and especially the astrophysically relevant ones. So these are the, the you could argue the big five uh, in the context of vacuum, you know, the, the big five conjectures you might um, wish to make. So, I mean, one is kind of obvious to, to, to see what this is saying. So Kerr stability, right? You, you had an initial data set for the Kerr exterior you perturb that initial data, does it still produce a Cauchy development, which is um, like Kerr? Right? So does it asymptote back to Kerr? Strong cosmic censorship, we won't be talking about, but essentially you could think of it as the conjecture whether or not the Cauchy horizon is stable under perturbations. Rigidity is whether stationary vacuum black hole solutions belong to the Kerr family. Weak cosmic censorship, generically, you know, is the, maximal future development of uh, vacuum initial data, does it lead to something that's globally quant uh, qualitatively like Kerr? So is there a complete scry? Is there an event horizon, et cetera? Um, and the final state conjecture is kind of wraps up all these conjectures together um, and asked whether vacuum, the vacuum development of uh, initial data that leads to, to trapped surfaces say, um, does that actually lead to a black hole space time, which in particular looks like Kerr? So uh, not just qualitatively, uh, so with regards to its global causal structure, but actually quantitative. So is the geometry approaching uh, Kerr? Right. So these are these are some of the big, uh, the you know very very big problems that that are all kind of open, um, and the first. The first route towards, um, well, it's a, it's a long road <laughs> to these to these problems. But the the first kind of dynamical formation result is is Christodoulou's result. Um, so 
again, this is for the um, Einstein uh, vacuum. We have short pulse data, which looks like this. So this is the traceless part of the um, uh, of the of the null second fundamental form on the uh, outgoing null cone. Uh, and so this is saying this is a small parameter. Um, there's this annoying setting which I must get rid of. Uh, and this is saying that essentially, you know, you will have, so this part is the existence part, right? The existence theorem. And this tells you that uh, if your data looks like this, right? Uh, then you get a solution to, to reach E zero, uh, at least in this region. Okay. And um, what's amazing about this result is that it's it's a balancing act between having initial data that's sufficiently uh, large that you can eventually form trap surfaces in the second part of the theorem, but that's sufficiently good that you can actually prove an existence theorem, right? And that's the whole balance of the proof. That's the whole difficulty of the proof. You need to construct initial data that you can actually solve, right? In 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 the sense of evolution, but it needs to be initial data that allows quantities to grow large. In particular, uh, this infimum is over the angles uh, on the initial sphere. So my, my angular parameter varies um, along the initial sphere and then it's transported along the outgoing no, outgoing no cone. So, so this is saying that you know, if, the, if the integral from zero to delta of the shear, so again, the traceless part of the null second fundamental form, if that's sufficiently large, um, then again, after picking your after picking your delta sufficiently small, then the sphere uh, at the top of the diagram is trapped. Right. So this is a dynamical formation of trap surfaces result. It was the first one of its kind, and it was the first time that people had initial data that didn't contain trap surfaces, but which in evolution led to the formation of trap surfaces. And there's no, you know, there's no symmetry assumptions here at all. It's just initial data. So in uh, 2012. Uh, Lee Yu put a paper on the archive, which eventually uh, was published in 2015 in, in the Annals of Mathematics, where essentially what they did was take the result of Christodoulou and use the corvino shane gluing arguments to add on uh, a Kerr slice onto the uh, slab, the space-time slab of Christodoulou. And there is an interpolating region where, where the space-time is, uh, is under control in some sense, at least for a sufficiently small uh, square. But the, the point is that you construct a Cauchy initial data set where there are no trap surfaces on this initial data set, but the future development of this initial data set has a trap surface. So it's a translation from a characteristic initial value problem to a Cauchy initial problem um, for the formation of trap surfaces. And what you get is that you get a concentric structure. So the first, um, the, the center, if you like, of your initial data set, so this is diffeomorphic to a ball, is a constant time slice in Minkowski. Uh, then at the, you know, out in infinity, you're isometric to a slice that embeds in Kerr uh, with uh, M close to M zero and small angular momentum in this way. Uh, and in between, you have this interpolating region. So this is the theorem of Li Yu. Uh, this out here is Kerr. Uh, and this is the Christodoulou slab. So these are the pulses of uh, radiation that are sent, right? This sphere up here is trapped. Uh, this is the, is the space-time slab that I told you that was under control. This is Minkowski. Uh, and you get a portion of uh, null infinity because, of course, this is Kerr. If this is Kerr, then you get a portion of null infinity, but you don't get the full null infinity. In particular, you know, you don't know what happens in this region up here. Um, so this region you don't know, and, and although you know that this sphere is trapped, you don't know anything about the trapped region, you don't know anything about marginally out of trapped surface, you don't know anything about an event horizon, you don't know anything about the geometry uh, in future 
infinity or future time like infinity. So it's a it's a good step, but it's 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 certainly not the um, a full black hole result because you know you haven't you haven't continued the space time. So this is this is the background result, and um, let's keep this in mind as we go forward. So, and Luke refined Christodoulou's result by basically having milder data. So you see before we had a delta appearing here and right with the shear, the shear was here but, and we had an extra derivative inside and we had a delta appearing here. So this is saying, you know, when you have this type of initial data, this is essentially, essentially saying that the shear is smaller, right? There's not as much shear. So it's milder data, but it's still strong enough, as in it's still large enough in that you can actually produce trapped surfaces. And part of the value of this improvement of, of their result is that you can actually understand the size of the, of the initial data that you need to have in order to form trapped surface. In particular, you relate that in terms of parameters related to the region of existence and the size of the initial data. So in Christodoulou's result, you, you had no control over this. You just had a region and you just said, right, if, if you crank up the initial data and if delta is taken sufficiently small, then you, you get a trapped surface. This is quantitative. This is saying, if the initial data is like this, then I need to choose my delta like this. And if I have a parameter A and B like that, then everything works. So you can think of it as a, as a kind of quantitative version of Christodoulou's result um, because, because of this precise dependence on the parameters. So this is what this slide is saying, right? In the Christodoulou result, you just have to pick delta sufficiently small. You have no idea how big delta needs to be. Whereas here, the size of delta is pinpointed in terms of the other constants relevant in the problem, other parameters, right? In particular, delta appears here in the size of the shear that you need. So for instance, if you, if you uh, fix your delta like this, then you actually recover Christodoulou's uh, theorem, but you have the added bonus of having an even larger existence region. So this is definitely, uh, a, a very, very interesting um, result, which kind of refines Christodoulou's formation. And so now I'm, I'm, you know, now I'm getting to the current work. How am I doing for time, by the way? Do I have about 10 minutes left? Um, hello? Bobby, are you still there? Yes, yes, yeah, yes, you have, uh, you have a few minutes left, yeah. You started right. only at four. Right. Okay. Good. So the so the basic idea is to do the same trick as Li Yu, construct the Cauchy data, but do it from this improvement, this improved result. Right. That's the basic idea. So this is this is a slide that tell you know that explains this. So we construct the Cauchy data for the formation of an apparent horizon, not just a single trap surface. And in that sense, you kind of obtain the scale critical version of Li Yu, where the later is kind of morally obtained as a corollary from the former. Right, so it's like a refinement, right? Now, what's interesting is that you can pinpoint the size of everything. How big delta needs to be, how big A needs to be, B, et cetera, all the, all the parameters. And from the point of view of, of general relativity and formation of black holes, you actually get a lot more. So you get a trapped region bounded by an apparent horizon rather than a single trapped surface, which was what you got from Christodoulou or, or Li Yu. And then modulo the enormous work going to stability, which, you know, granted is not proven yet, you, you actually get a, a class of conditional examples that we cosmic censorship and final state, which is different from Li Yu's because you have different estimates for this milder data, which in particular allows for a weaker statement that, that, that you need to use of cursed ability in order to complete your space times and to, and to go all the way up to future time like infinity. Uh, and then the final bonus is that you actually because of this milder data and this extra control you can get on everything, uh, you actually obtain area estimates for the marginally out of trap surfaces that foliate the uh, apparent horizon. And what that means is that you can actually see the apparent horizon growing, right? So you can actually think about Penrose's inequality now, and you can give a dynamical setup, a dynamical kind of, you know, scenario in which you can verify and see what happens to Penrose's inequality in a dynamical setting, right? Which, which, is, which is new.
So what does the initial data look like? I was going to bore you with this, but actually with time running on, I'd, I'd rather show you a diagram. In short, you know, you have to add an extra, an extra delta, but it's still, it's still critical in the, in the sense of Van Luke. So this, there was an extra, extra power in Christodoulou's result. There's an extra, extra, extra delta to the half of it that we don't have. Uh, you have to kind of assume this, you know, this condition, which says that once you've integrated up, up to delta, then there's no angular dependence on the shear. So this is nothing like spherical symmetry. It's just saying that, that after you've integrated along all the directions, uh, you actually get something that's independent of theta, uh, which is the, which is the, the right angular parameter on the initial sphere. And then you have to kind of modulate your initial data carefully. Uh, in particular, you have to kind of interpolate between a linear dependence in U bar of the of the integral of the shear uh, and a constant value. And this is what this what this condition is doing. And that comes from Anne's work. I mean, it, it's not in Anne's work, but we had to, you know, in order to build an apparent horizon, in order to have marginally out of trap surfaces as opposed to trapped regions, you or as opposed to a single trap surface, you need to control the data a lot more. So this is the first theorem. Um, I mean, the, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bore you with speaking and, and, and just, I'm just gonna show you a picture. So this is what the theorem says. You know, the theorem says you send an apostle radiation, you form uh, an apparent horizon. So here, every, every, um, every so this is, this is a, a tube, if you like, that's foliated by marginally out of trapped surfaces. You get this trapped region full of trapped surfaces uh, and, and you get this extra region and you kind of, have these, uh, you know, estimates for for all the relevant quantities in this in this apparent horizon. You can even see the apparent horizon tending to something not right. So the well known idea that apparent horizons, you know, tend to event horizons. You can kind of see that at a at a at a at a you know at a semi global level. I mean, you don't have an event horizon here, but but at a semi global level. And then this is the Cauchy initial data statement. So you have your you have your parameters in the interpolating region. You have the concentric stru structure on the initial data set. You have some quantitative control over how big epsilon needs to be, how big delta needs to be, et cetera, which are things that you couldn't have had before. And this is the theorem. So the theorem says, you know, you send in a pulse of radiation, then you stop the radiation along this hypersurface, then you get an apparent horizon, you get area estimates, let's zoom in, you get area estimates for the MOTs that foliate this region. So that because of the gluing now, because of the curve, you know, end with the controlled ADM mass and angular momentum, you can now test the Penrose inequality on these kinds of slices. You can see the Penrose inequality actually being proven dynamically in the course of evolution. You get some, some estimates and some control on, the, on, a, on this region here. Um, let, me, let me change the, whoops, uh, there we go. And then you get, in particular, you get estimates here for the, for the quantities, which look like this. So all the left-hand sides here, are with respect to M0, uh, and that's a Schwarzschild's base time of mass M0. So all the quantities here are with respect to a Schwarzschild uh, base time. And then all the right-hand sides have a delta or a delta to the half or U's, et cetera, which tell you how, how, you know, how big these things. But with this extra control, um, you, can, you can find out you know, what's the way, what, how do I make these estimates as small as, as I can? Uh, and, and for that, you choose your parameters wisely um, and you can show that everything here on the right-hand side depends on C, constant independent of delta times delta. So essentially, they can be made as small as you like, choosing, choosing delta as small as you, as you like. So that, that's how that works. So this is what this slide is saying. Express everything in terms of delta or A or B. This is the extra parameter freedom that, that is allowed to you by the quantitative version of Christodoulou's result, which you didn't have before, and that came from Anne Luke. Uh, the worst estimate is like this. The mods is located here. So, you know, evaluating this, you get something like this, and then you want to make this uh, C as big as you can. A is a large constant. Uh, and so you end up getting with estimates that look like this, where C is independent of delta. This C is not the same as this C. And that means that essentially you can make the initial data as small as you like, so as close as you like to Schwarzschild or Kerr. And that means the stability result will carry you all the way up to future time like infinity. The Penrose inequalities, this is my last slide, the Penrose inequality, well, the, here the area estimates, right, for the relevant quantity appearing in the Penrose inequality is kind of linear and new bar and looks like this in terms of the other, of the other parameters. Um, and, you get a, and you get an equation for M0, which is the, the thing you eventually glue to. 
Um, and then you know the ADM mass of your curve and is close to M0 in a particular sense. Uh, and so if you want to test the Penrose inequality dynamically, what you do is, you know, you take the relevant, you know, left-hand side of the Penrose inequality, the thing that needs to be larger than zero, you have estimates for the mass, you have estimates for the area of the mods, and so you can start, you can start understanding what this term is doing. And what you get is this. And then you can evaluate the inequality here, and you can choose your parameters once again, fix all your parameters to try and make this greater than zero. And um, and you get that you can you can prove it right. So after choosing suitably your parameters in a way that consistent with the initial data, you eventually uh, prove that this is true for um, the MOTs appearing in your dynamically created apparent horizon. All right. Well, I should probably stop there then. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Now we can still have a few questions. We're running over time, but. It's the last talk, so anybody? So Martin, your uh, your space time at Dan is it Kerr or is it Schwarzschild? So out here it's Kerr, and then here it's a perturbation of Schwarzschild, and then here. But Kerr is of course a perturbation of Schwarzschild, so so. Yeah. Maybe the question is, does it have angular momentum or something like that? At Dan? Yeah, it, it it has angular momentum, but the angular momentum is small. Thanks. Yeah. But it could be zero, couldn't it? Or not? No. It's not going to be zero because um, to kill the kernel in the gluing problems, to kill the kernel, uh, you you need some leeway in the because you you yeah, you need some like there could be angular momentum in this initial data. You could try and fix the angular momentum to be zero, but I don't know how to do that um in terms of the initial data so you could fix that and maybe you can try and glue to Schwarzschild but I don't know how to do that um because that would that would involve expressing the angular momentum in terms of this initial data here but this initial data here is already very constrained by the problem by everything by trying to control everything so you so you have this extra angular freedom which leads to some angular momentum which appears when you try and kill the kernel later on to do the gluing Anything else? So in this drawing, the space time is really defined to the future of this light cone and this uh, space asymptotic flat space-like surface, right? Yeah. So the space time, the the portion of the space time that's missing and that would be given if curve stability was known would be everything up here. But what about to the past? Well, to the past, uh, you'd have to, well, to the past is a good question. What you'd have to do is, well, so we don't, we haven't extended this all the way back to past non infinity, but in principle, that's doable. But that would be harder because then you'd have to control a larger portion of the space time. In particular, you'd have to control what happens here. And we also don't know how to do that because that. You know that region now this gray region here is close to a Schwarzschild black hole so proving something about here is close to stability of Schwarzschild and so so in other words we don't know you know in other words the past is not known but but we know the future <laughs> if if curse stability works yeah um So oh, there doesn't seem to be any more questions or remarks. So let's let's thank Martin again and all the speakers of this session.